Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Soul Sessions with Creative Mind. That's right, uh, and it's a new year, and we're starting a new series. New series and a new season, season five. Wow, time flies. Ah, huh? We've been renewed. <laughs> we've renewed ourselves. So what is today's, what, what, well, let's talk about first, what is the new series about, the next couple well, sessions? Yeah, so we left off uh, talking about emotions and the power of emotions and a, a little bit of how to work with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... This is a a unique part of our approach uh, and our work with uh, Jungian theory is that we get to use mythology. Yes. Because myths essentially are speaking the same language as dreams. And dreams are essentially uh, the messages that are coming from the unconscious mind. So when we look at mythology, we're looking at important psychological elements of psyche, mm-hmm. according to Jung, and a lot of people, of course, not a lot Jung. of people, <laughs> a lot uh, of a it, lot of thinkers. Yes, and and uh, mythology. If we think about from ancient Greek mythology, Roman mythology, but also uh, religious mythology, um, and then our modern mythology, the the stories of today, movies, books, uh, these wonderful. Uh, series that you watch on Netflix, uh, uh, and you're caught up in, you know, the uh, the um, the drama. It's all based on mythology. Yeah. So hopefully, we'll give you an idea of how relevant myths, myths, and mythology in general can be to uh, your everyday life. You mm-hmm. your work with your own mind with emotions. I know that uh, I can uh, now watching movies with you. It, it's more than just uh, watching entertainment. It's uh, really a, a learning experience because we both discuss what archetypes are showing up in the movie. And it's just really sure. um, interesting. So that's an um, important part of our life as human beings. We live through story. And Makes the sense. stories of the myths have uh, across different cultures seem to be very similar so there must be something beyond just our conscious awareness that is driving these myths and that's what Jung called the collective unconscious yes so let's go back to freud and Jung. Uh, Mm. um, and this is 1900 uh the turn of the century freud publishes his interpretation of dreams Mm. which really uh blew uh kind of Jung's mind Mm. because here was somebody actually bringing up this ancient art in a scientific, in a psychological, the science of that time at least, um, in a psychological paradigm. Mm. Uh, Let's say a bona fide way of talking about these important uh, pieces of psyche that have been around since the beginning of time, basically. Human beings had always paid attention to dreams, but after the enlightenment and after the industrial revolution people lost uh, track of that they Mm -hmm. lost interest in it they lost the art Uh, so freud did us a great favor by publishing that book around 1900 and reviving the whole idea of yeah this is an important piece of human psychology let's study it Mm -hmm. so then young of course jumps on board and he becomes a the head of psychoanalytic uh, society for a while he's kind of running the show and and freud is ready to give him the crown (laughs) the key the the secession (laughs) that's right and make him the prince uh, Mm. heir to his throne but at that time around uh, 1908 uh, somewhere around there jung starts to get disillusioned with uh, uh, freud's kind of hold on psychoanalysis and his insistence on the sexual theory and other things but Jung really wanted to take it to another level you mentioned the collective unconscious that was the birth of his idea Mm -hmm. he's he wanted to look at history at anthropology and and of course Freud had done some of that but Jung wanted to take it to the next level and and start to, started to think about what's going on collectively if, like you say, 
these myths and these symbols and these archetypes are showing up all around the world mm. in very different contexts, but essentially the same themes mm. over and over. And so Jung came up with this idea of the collective unconscious. That there's something that ties us all together that as Absolutely. human humans and this experience that we have, that we're not as separate as we think we are and that we have this joint experience and yeah. uh, common common fears common uh aspirations common challenges yeah absolutely and and there is uh, you know the there is still a debate as to how scientific it is and and uh, or you know where should we fit that uh young's model it it does fit of course into uh more into literature into philosophy than than scientific psychology but it's still such an important part of um, human nature that we don't want to throw it away. We mm. want to value it and, and give it its uh, its due. Now, there is even scientific evidence that there is something going on there mm. of this transmission of emotions and experiences through what's called epigenetics now. That's still a stretch, but the, there's... This there's like encoding our memory is encoded in our DNA. That's right. And passed down. So so generational memory. Yeah. And actually, that makes a lot of sense because for survival purposes, wouldn't it be good to prepare the body for the, the, the offspring for the dangers that the parent um, learned to adapt to in the culture and society and that, that kind of passed down through the next generation so they don't repeat the same patterns? Or yes. they can protect themselves from danger and all that. And that's how evolution worked yeah. initially, right? It's just there's an adaptation, adaptation, adaptation from a physical standpoint. But now that we don't need that as much, we have that psychological adaptation. How do we fit in socially? <laughs> that's not really our, our survival as a modern human is how do we survive socially? Yeah, and so uh, mythology then, Jung saw it as the language of the unconscious mind. Why myths? Because it's like the collective dreams. So mm. as individuals, we have dreams that speak in that, uh, that symbolic language. He would say that as, as societies, as cultures, we have these myths that are equal to dreams mm. to the individual. And we have evidence of that personally because both of us We've worked with thousands of people who've gone through our trainings, our courses, and we see the same dreams show up in different people from all over the world. Oh, there's that dream of the snake, or there's a dream of the house falling down, the dream <laughs> of going into the unknown, into the, the cave, or going down into the basement, um, flying dreams. And, and well, where where's that, you know, where is that information <clears throat> kept? And Jung said, collective unconscious. So we we know, we see it. And it's something a lot of times uh, our clients will dream of some a myth that they never even read about, but they'll have a dream that's pointing to the myth. So they didn't have a personal experience of it. So there must be a collective mind that that person is connected to. And yeah. that's really what we love about Jung's work, because it takes us into the spiritual realm, into the non-physical, not just the physical body, but we're going into not only the personal mind, but the transpersonal mind which is um, very cool so this uh, episode is about medusa the myth of medusa which is my favorite myth uh, very, uh, one of the first myths you uh, kind of aligned and showed me how it impacted my life and really it's about how to transform anger so very mythical but also practical yeah so we wanted to give you an example of you know, how does this, uh, this strange mythology, because it is strange. Uh, mm. the, we know the language of the unconscious, the symbolic language is very weird mm. uh, to our rational mind, especially to modern humans. Uh, the, the language of dreams appears bizarre. Mm -hmm. e the same as mythologies. Mm -hmm. do. Uh, if you look at any mythologies from any culture, it, they, they're strange. They're not following logical rules. Even writers uh, writing fiction books, they, they're using their imagination and, and they come up with the, this structure 
of a story, but it matches myths from, you know, it, sometimes they borrow the myth, <laughs> but other times it's, it's this sort of falls into some sort of organization, uh, some yeah. sort of pattern. And uh, that's what archetypes are. It's the, yeah, so very much like dreams, myths are not created in a conscious way. Mm hmm. There, there is, of course, people that, that compile the stories and write them down. But the myths uh, essentially are born spontaneously, generated spontaneously from the unconscious mind. Just like in when you fall asleep, you have a dream. Mm. You don't plan it out. It essentially happens in your psyche. The same happens with these stories that uh, reappear all over the planet different times. But the same themes. Now, one important element in understanding mythology is that the blood, for example, or violence in a, in a, in a myth, in a story, does not mean what it means in our rational way of thinking. Just like dreams, uh, it's a symbolic language. We see a lot of people have dreams of murdering and hiding the body. And they're like, oh, I, I really don't like that. What happened in that dream? But it, it's we point to that it's not literal. You, we can't take that literally. And you can't take myths literally. That's yes. the important part is that people look at myths and say, ooh, that's like what happened back in ancient Greece. No, that it was a myth. And it, if you notice, uh, the Romans have this uh, similar gods and... Uh, in, in different religions, there's similar myths that show up all the time. Um, even uh, India, the myths of India. Uh, and, all, yeah, you know, all myths essentially speak the symbolic language mm -hmm. of the unconscious mind, just like dreams. Uh, so keep that in mind as we talk about Medusa, mm -hmm. because the imagery, if we try to read it literally, it simply kind of reads as this violent story of uh, a, 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 a hero. hero journey soldier uh, kind of fighting this monster and beheading her and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and that pers that's, winning the battle and yes, know, so crushing it, the the negative. Yeah, it makes for an interesting movie, perhaps mm -hmm. <laughs> an interesting movie, <laughs> but it's not the meaning of the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wanted to talk about three main characters. Uh, associated with the Medusa story. Of course, Medusa herself, who is a Gargon, mm -hmm. and is one of the daughters of Poseidon, who uh, yeah, is kind of this monstrous uh, feminine figure, very much associated with uh, the snake, mm -hmm. because all of these uh, women had wings and had snakes for hair. Mm. Now, the serpent power, we know, is a symbol that comes up all over the planet. Mm -hmm. It is associated with the Kundalini, mm -hmm. with the spiritual power, spiritual power, magic. Uh, the snake was in the garden and Adam and Eve. Yeah. Higher knowledge. Mm -hmm. So now you're starting, you get a sense of what Medusa is representing. She's just not an angry monster woman. But... There's a aspect of that. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll talk about the, how psychologically it relates to aspects of individuation or the hero's inner journey as we go through through the individuation process. So there's Medusa, who is uh, kind of this guardian of the underworld, let's mm. say. Then, of course, the hero, Perseus. So Perseus is on a journey like most heroes are, and he he goes around gathering uh, these magical uh, weapons and protecting gear from the gods. Or... And he's half god, half human. Yes. So, he's uh, the son of Zeus. Yes, and th that's a typical hero image as well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that the hero is not only a human being, but also associated with the divine element mm -hmm. god the gods so perseus uh gets the shield a magical sh shield from athena he gets a sword from her uh he gets also uh an invisibility cap very I much like frodo <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the the lord yeah, of the rings yeah. that is able to cloak himself and become invisible mm -hmm. um 
And he also gets uh, the sandals, the winged sandals of Hermes, who is a, a trickster figure. He's considered a trickster and a messenger of the gods. Um, so already we see that the myth is talking about uh, kind of this transformation that the individual has to go through in facing these deeper challenges of the unconscious mind represented by the Medusa. Um, he needs the powers, the blessings, mm -hmm. the protection of the divine element. Mm. And so uh, so there's Perseus, there's Medusa, and then the third character? Are we talking about that yet? The third character then is Pegasus. My favorite. When I was a kid, I loved the winged <laughs> horse. I love horses. So. But I didn't realize uh, all the mythology around it. So in the story, uh, when Perseus, through, through his use of these magical weapons, is able to slay Medusa and behead her, cut off her head, um, from her neck, from her bleed, from her blood in her neck, uh, arises Pegasus. Hmm. In other words, Pegasus, as the power of the imagination, the poetic imagination in humans, is only born after the hero is able to conquer his fear hmm. and his anger. So, in Jungian terms, when we look at the story, so we have the story of uh, Peg uh, uh, Perseus. His job was to slay Medusa. And then one of the things about Medusa, too, that you left out is that she, when she looked at you directly, she turned, to, turned you to stone. That's right. And so the, all these p previous warriors went there, and they would go to slay her, and then she'd look at them, and they would freeze and turn to stone. So uh, that's also a very important part of our psychological analysis. That's right. So yeah, so the basic, the basic story uh, is that Pegasus, uh, Perseus is, is on his journey, on his hero's journey. He's out to save uh, the maiden, the city, <laughs> as all heroes are mm -hmm. on, on this quest and this journey. And part of his challenge, of course, then is to slay Medusa. Uh, she turns people to stone if, if, let's say, if you gaze at her directly, you turn to stone, you freeze, and that will come in handy as we examine it from a Jungian perspective. Uh, so he uses the shield that he got from Athena, and instead of looking directly at her, he looks at the reflection on the shield. Mm. And he guides himself with that and is able then to behead her. Now the head now becomes a weapon for him because he's able then to use it. Against to, his enemies. Yeah. Yes, against the the, uh, uh, his, the, monsters. the other monster <laughs> that he has to slay. Yeah. Um, and as he slays her, then Pegasus is born, mm. the winged horse, right? So let's look at those three elements there, or the, the three characters. What would Jung say, or how would we interpret that myth from a Jungian perspective, and what does it mean for our individual life today? Well, I think uh, when we first met, you and I, um, I came home one day, and I, you may have heard this story before, those of you who listen to our podcast. It's also in my book. Um, the this woman was very mad at me and I was like very hurt and I came home and I just felt this like powerlessness, this like, like kind of victimy, like this woman is so mad at me and I, you know, I don't know what to do to fix it. And I didn't do anything wrong. Like I was just, I felt very helpless and it was, I was so triggered by it. And you showed me how, um, two people in the unconscious reflect off each other. And then you told me the story of Medusa and you said, well, the, you can't look at your own, you, the, he goes, you said, that's your own anger. And I said, I'm not angry. She's the angry one. And he, you said about Perseus, he needed the shield to, to reflect 
And he said, that's what pe the people out in our world do. They reflect parts of our mind so we can see see it directly because if we look at it directly we would turn to stone we <laughs> we we freeze if we think we're bad we're terrible so we have to project it out there that's the power of the shadow and so when you told me that and you said it was my anger i was like i'm not angry <laughs> but when i really started sitting with that feeling i realized it was all about my pleasing and so the suppression of anger when you're pleasing most women that are want to fit in and want to make sure be liked, we end up repressing our anger. So I love that the shield is so the people that irritate us the most are showing us our own mind. And I love that. Um, that that's where I, I see the shield part as part of this Jungian philosophy is this idea that this shadow can only be seen because it's unconscious in the people that annoy us and Yep. make us unhappy which is, is it feels like they're not it's out there but we're really having an experience of our own mind that's right yeah so the myth really captures the this challenge for us because mm -hmm. in the individuation process we have to become our own hero it, because the challenge for us as individuals or if we want to become individuals fully uh, fully matured, let's say, and making our own decisions in life. Not like a grown-up? Like a grown-up, <laughs> not tied to the mother, uh, kind of to, symbolically, right, to uh, the conditioning of our mother. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have, to, we have to face the dark aspect of the mother that is in the unconscious mind. In Which is words, another uh, aspect of the story is Medusa represents the negative mother archetype. Or that's right. The dark mother. Yes. Uh, her association with the serpent uh, places her in the realm of the dark mother. Mm. Uh, uh, or Jung would, would call that uh, a negative mother complex. Meaning it, it doesn't mean that uh, there's evil in the mother it simply means that just like in us half of us is is part of a or is aware and conscious we live in the conscious world and the other half or uh depends how you split it up but the other part is unconscious mm -hmm. and is inac inaccessible to us we cannot see the unconscious mind Going into that realm, into the realm of the Dark Mother, it signifies or symbolically means we're going into the unconscious mind. And that's the, the hero's journey. Mm. We have to go into ourselves, into the psyche, into the forbidden parts of the psyche, and conquer our anger, our fear. Just like a warrior has to have fear and anger under control, and and be able to use the weapons it's like a discipline yes very much a, a discipline way of doing <clears throat> if if he or she wants to reach adulthood mm -hmm. uh individuation as young would call, call it um they they have to undergo this trial by fire of uh, facing the dark aspects of the mother archetype and and here in Perse the Perseus story, we see that kind of playing out. That if he wants the imagination, the power of creative imagination, which is represented mother. by Pegasus, and but also the mother is creative energy as well. Yeah, she's I mean, the creation. She is the reason why we're here. She we have all have a mother. She's a, she's right. a creative force. Yeah, she gives birth. To yeah, that. yeah. Uh, so symbolically, you see Pegasus coming from the body of the, the dark mother. So in other words, if you don't face the negative mother and you don't free the imagination, you're basically living on the surface. You're living in on the conscious level on your conditioned. And you may not even be conscious of the impact your mother on a personal level has on you. And you're just living out, basically responding to that experience of the mother child. And you're um, whether your mother was nurturing or whether your mother was critical, you're still impacted by her. And so yeah. if you don't make that conscious, like see both sides of her, uh, all of her, uh, which is all of you, then you're going to 
just live out the old pattern. And um, for most people, it's, it's kind of scary to, because our life is basically mediocre, you know, it's just enough. And it's a risk to go and we, we fear that things will just fall apart. And the ego fears that. So that's why there's that. We need the warrior energy to face that part of ourselves. Absolutely. And in Medusa, you also see that she represents the, the animal nature. Mm. So if you think about where our bodies come from, where did we evolve from, like we were talking about earlier, what, what, what was our evolution? We evolved from animals, from the animal world. And so part of our journey as human beings is to be able to transcend that those those genes those predispositions those animalistic survival strategies in us and medusa represents that challenge wouldn't you say if you look at our modern world we would say oh we're so cultured we live in houses we're not like eating and rummaging <laughs> and killing each other on the streets but there's sort of a subliminal anger and um, and and kind of um, aggression. And if you look at wars in the world and famine and selfishness and all these things, we're still in a way, if we're not conscious, if we're not individuated, we're almost living on an animal level, but we have nice little clothes on and put a little makeup on in our hair and we hide it. But deep within us, there's still those urges. And um, we have to, it's the force of that is also imagination, also the, the information from just the world and, and of the, all the history of the world that we can access. And yes. well, that's why the indigenous people had all the rituals and they were so close to nature. And then we think we're so more evolved because we have little houses and we can go on the computer, but yeah. they were closer to the earth and, and, and all that magic that we, we lost. Yeah, it, it's always a question of balance. So mm. I don't think Jung would advocate that we get rid of technology and go back to no. living. In but it a, can be a, a distraction from. But right. what it is, it's a lopsidedness that yeah. we place too much emphasis on the conscious, rational mind and and ignore the power of the unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is it builds up mm -hmm. as shadow. Yeah, that's essentially the, the building up of the shadow that. It, anything we ignore and we repress as our nature, we, we're giving it energy. And it's going to come out then in an unconscious way, as aggression, as violence. Or as, sexual, acting out sexually. and cetera, of, As war, as, uh, you know, un, uncaring for the earth. Shaming people on social media. That's right. You know, getting into the tribal, like, uh, horde ment uh, what's it, the... Uh, mentality of just like uh, let's attack, let's all get together and hate this person or hate this idea. Yes, and and the function of dreams was or is precisely that to allow some of that shadow pressure to come out in in a creative way mm. in human societies. So you see the Aztecs undergoing a ritual human sacrifice and. You know, from our perspective, it looks like a barbaric practice, but essentially they were practicing this idea that the gods require Sacrifice? their due. Yeah, they require their the acknowledgement and and kind of given their place uh, in in a mythological poetic sense, mm -hmm. uh, and that that was part of the ritual to bring about this mythology into life. Uh, wouldn't you say that um, a lot of times when we have these dreams, it's not it doesn't all have to happen on a conscious level, that the dreams when we're dreaming and we're interacting with the dreams and paying attention mm -hmm. to them, it's sort of an integration in a way because we're kind of giving uh, reverence to the dream and we're honoring the dream and we're, we're understanding it and integrating it into our life. Our understanding is a way of shifting our psyche. Absolutely. Good, because if you think as in terms of rational and ir irrational, the rational part of our psyche is our ability to do things and to build things in the waking world. The irrational mind then is expressed through dreams and through mythology, where it doesn't follow the rules of rationality. It's symbolic. Mm -hmm. It's emotional. Mm -hmm. It's 
the the it's a little source, chaotic sometimes. That's yeah. right. But the union of two of the two is incredible because then you have logic and passion working together. A lot of times people the sword could represent the logic and the masculine energy because Perseus was a man, obviously, most heroes were in that day, uh, because it was run by men, but that's another story. Well, but yeah, but the goddesses yeah. were Athena, yeah. and, and so... But that, yeah. You, you're not, yeah, it's not political. It, yeah. it, it is a, a great balance of yeah. things. But uh, the idea that he had to let that masculine, the feminine, that he had to slay the feminine, is uh, uh, or the dark feminine is really his way of ba- coming to that balance within Absolutely. himself. And as Jung would call it, the anima is really the acting out. But that logic is the sword cutting through and freeing the imagination, yeah. like the, the combination. Yeah, it, it is the, the balancing of the two, right? Mm-hmm. The reconnecting, as Jung would say, of the conscious and the unconscious mind, the in- integration of those two elements. Mm-hmm. That's what brings about a, a true maturity in the in the hero's journey mm. in the individuation process if we don't connect with our unconscious mind that irrational part of us that mythology that's symbolic even the emotional form, part of us <laughs> then then our life has no passion mm-hmm. it, it's simply logical it's reasonable it, it is persona as young would say it, it's adaptive to society and, but it's still tied to the mother culture, what our, what we were taught as children and what we were taught to be to behave this certain way. So we're not really free. So it's like we're stones walking around, <laughs> like we're turned to stone? <laughs> in a way, yeah. Mm-hmm. We, we are still kind of that element in an elemental state. Rigid and... Yes, and still kind of heavy. Yeah, it's like the heaviness of... And we all can feel it. Like we know... Like when people say that I, they feel they, they've lost their passion in life, they want to do something with their life. A lot of our clients are right on the at cusp of individuation. They're, they're ready for it. They're in that like stagnation. They feel this heaviness. Like, I don't know what to do next. And mm-hmm. after a while, you can't just live your life the way you did the early part of life. or you, It's just going to get tighter and tighter and tighter. And this individuation is really the key to open up and soften uh, that those rigid edges and help you become more flexible in the world. And uh, all those, uh, you know, the, the ego loves the rigidity. The ego loves the rules, loves mm-hmm. the judgment, and uh, bringing in that beautiful uh, balance to our lives and uh, express these deeper uh, transpersonal passions that we're here to create. Yes, yeah, so at a psychological level then, we're talking about these kind of very instinctual emotions that we inherited from our evolution, mm-hmm. uh, from animal life. Uh, this kind of uh, aggression, anger, uh, drive for life, uh, a kind of looking out for ourselves and making sure we survive. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if we want to also access the, the, the higher elements of the psyche... Right, our ability to imagine, uh, to philosophize, to express compassion and transcend our ego state, then we have to uh, come to terms with those parts of our psyche. And that's what the myth of Medusa is talking about. The coming to terms with that powerful anger that's at the core of our biological beingness so that then we can use our higher imagination, our spiritual power. Well, I have a, a really good example for everyone that you can, if you've ever felt this way, it's really that the anger can be on one extreme hyper aggressive and then the lack of anger the or the rejection of anger is like a wimpy energy. Mm-hmm. It's like a wimpy, poor me the world is terrible. I got to be careful. Like you're not even using any of your power, especially, well, I say men and women both, but I, I see it as, or I've experienced it myself as I, I don't like anger. So I'm just going to, it's almost like you're comfortable being powerless and, uh, and you don't know why you, you can't speak up in a situation or uh, defend yourself. You don't have that 
capacity. So you maybe avoid a situation. You don't like confrontation. And it's kind of this wimpy energy, this like whimper. And you we all felt it in some way or another. But And usually by someone who feels or we project the authority onto. You know, if you that person's the authority, then you're like, you, you submit. So anger, having a healthy relationship with anger and passion helps balance that out. So you're not in the extreme of aggression where you're just beaten down so much that you finally break free. But if you look at bullies, they are unconsciously that little wimpy little boy, little girl, and they come across as these aggressive personas because they haven't balanced it out either. So they're, they're using anger, but in a very egoic way versus the anger, the energy of being passion, of being um, uh, power of expression. Mm. And I think that's really what we want. We want to own our power instead of feeling this like little, little pea in the world that's going to get stepped on and squashed. So that's kind of how I experience it, that, yeah. that um, it's, it's being willing to work with it, not just say anger's bad and I don't want anything yeah. to do with it. Yeah, it's able to to transform it. It's mm -hmm. being able to transform the energy of anger because it, emotions are just emotional energy. Uh, we are the ones that label them as bad or good, but there are no bad emotions. They're, they're simply like ways of feeling and, and, and kind of sensing the world. Well, I find that the people that create anger in your life or that trigger you, that piss you off, they are really giving you an opportunity. It's like kind of kicks mm. it up from unconscious and it's, it's ready to, for you to work with. And what we tend to do is want to either get back at them or gossip about them or, you know, passive aggressively, you know, post on social media about them, but not really go directly and use that power. Um, and, uh, and so we want to be able to use it. And the situation I told you, we started out with the, the woman that was mad at me. Yeah. It, it At first, when you said it was my anger, I really got to the point where I was like, you know, that pressure of needing to please everyone. And then I really got into the anger. And that's what, when it transformed, because I started looking at it from just not a character that a person a did this to person b and this is what happened it was like what's going on underneath in my psyche what's what's the cause in these patterns from uh, early in life and and uh, what how can i use that power to uh, to channel and uh, into something creative and that's really what happened i felt so much love after i sat with it um and you know we talk about well what is transforms anger and love transforms anger and it sounds so simple like love your enemy but love it's more like that un, un uh, unconditional love uh, unconditional compassion not to be a doormat but to kind of uh love the the lesson that that person taught you oh, it yeah. doesn't mean they don't they have their own issues and you don't keep boundaries and all those things but it's about what can you how can i take this this altercation and make it positive make it something not positive but make it something creative and i found that that was such a freeing opportunity and it would have never came up if this angry person had shown up, it would have never came up. I would have it would have been sitting there under the surface, and I would have still been pleasing for another forty years. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and it doesn't mean that it it gets over immediately. Like when you're working with these emotions, it's it takes time to. We're so ingrained in our patterns that it takes time to really be free. Yeah, <clears throat> and these are cycles. Uh, mm. I would say that of the hero's journey. Well, once we reemerge from the darkness of the psyche, uh, we're ready to go back again, mm. but at a higher level, right? To to work at at higher uh, levels. Mm -hmm. So you might have worked on this, and then you're kind of everything. You may have a shift, and then you're ready to go to the next level. I like say you're getting into a new relationship, or you're getting into a new career, or a new level in your career or more money you're making or new babies being born or whatever life change happens new level new devil new level new devil and uh the old stuff will try to surface again to to get you from evolving and that's just the ego's way so it'll just yeah. 
kind of like, ooh, that anger stopped her before. Let me try it again. And so um, I find that for me, as uh, what those cycles, I, I almost have to revisit. And I think, oh, I thought I worked on this already. <laughs> and it, there's still just another layer. And I, if you think of it as like a mandala, you see it's it, the center is the self, but all those little um, decorations around it, there's little subtleties of working and, and seeing it from different angles. It's just more uh, depth to your understanding of it. Absolutely. And, uh, and so we continue. Uh, our series on mythology uh, is uh, going to continue next week with the creation myth. Yes. Adam and Eve, we're going to go back to the garden and eat the apple of knowledge of uh, <laughs> apple, the fruit of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil That's right. Uh, from the tree of knowledge. So we'll uh, very interesting topic. And uh, so uh, don't forget to subscribe to us. If you're watching us on YouTube, there's a button right here in the corner that subscribe so you can make sure you get every episode and follow us on iTunes, Spotify, and all anywhere you listen to us, Apple podcasts, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Take care. Happy New Year. Thank you.